Okay, tonight we're going to look at a subject that many are affected by, but for some reason many are afraid to admit it. So what we're going to look at tonight, a lot of people, if they were honest, they would admit, yes, Tony, I struggle in that area. But very few have honestly and upfront and publicly said, I need help with this. To say that this is an area of struggle will cause sometimes other Christians to look down on those Christians. They'll say, well, you struggle with that. You know, I, I thought you were saved. Saved people don't deal with that. But the few that by God's grace do not struggle with what we're going to look at tonight, those people are often looked at with envy and with jealousy. So what we're going to talk about tonight, and I'll mention it in a minute what it is, there may be a few, and I would guess a small handful of people after tonight's message that can honestly say, Tony, I don't struggle with that. And if that is you, tonight's message is not meant to put you down or say anything is wrong with you. If anything, it is to magnify the grace of God in your life. But I would guess that tonight's subject is going to be felt by many, many people. Some people say, if only I could have such a testimony. If only I could be like those few Christians who do not struggle with this particular fight this particular battle now working with the young people uh, tonight's topic comes up a lot of times as a matter of fact we had a, a graduation thing uh, a couple of weeks ago and this topic of discussion came up during that time as well I've spoken many times with young people sometimes in my office sometimes on the phone sometimes via text message sometimes in the teen center sometimes in other places about this very thing but it's not just something that affects young people. It also affects people regardless of their age. Years ago, I was preaching, maybe, maybe three, four years ago, somewhere in there, preaching, I believe it was on a Sunday morning, and someone who, not here this evening, but he normally sits over in this section, middle-aged man, came up to me after the service with tears in his eyes, and he said, Tony, thank you for saying what you said. I've dealt with that my entire life. But it's not just something that young people face and middle-aged people face, but it's even something that I've been told that by elderly people that is something they deal with too. I preached basically the same message at a church in Salem, South Carolina, up in Pickens County uh, a few years ago since I've been a youth pastor. And there was a lady, I don't know, maybe in her 80s, if, if I had to guess, who came up with me. And, and by the way she spoke, I think it's safe to assume that she had a, a typical don't take this the wrong way, but elderly person testimony, grew up in church her whole life, had been in church her whole life, would profess to have been a Christian most of her life. But after I preached a message similar to tonight's topic, she told me in more or less words, thank you so much for saying what you said. I needed to hear that. So tonight's topic isn't just something that affects certain groups or certain ages or people in certain upbringings. It seems to be a question that is on the conscience of Christians from all different times in church history. Now, probably many people here, if they were honest tonight, would admit that they battle with what we're going to talk about tonight. And in that battle, it affects your joy. And it steals your joy. And it robs your joy. It deprives you of joy. And it hurts you spiritually. I will be honest enough to admit that I have fought and battled and dealt with and I do fight and battle and deal with and I would guess that unless God does some drastic miracle probably in the years ahead I will still but probably on a, a less frequent basis fight, battle and deal with what we're going to talk about tonight. I will be honest enough to admit that to you and I would trust that there's probably going to be a few of you after tonight's service Maybe you won't say it publicly, but you'll come up to me tonight in private and say, Tony, thank you so much for admitting you battle with that because I battle with it as well. My biggest shock in something pertaining to tonight's lesson also turned into one of my biggest encouragements. Say, Tony, how can the biggest shock turn into the biggest encouragement? Well, have you ever had something that you deal with and you fight with and you struggle with and you battle with and you, you, you fight and you, you strive against and you think you're the only one who battles that problem? 
If you don't fellowship regularly with other believers in honest communion with one another, you know what will happen? You'll think you're the only one in the fight. You'll think that you're the only one in the battle. You'll think you're the only one dealing with the problems that you face. Well, in the fall of 2014, I believe it was, I met someone from church history who, to my shock and also my encouragement, if it happened with him, then who am I to think, you know, that, I, that I'm beyond that? I met someone from church history who I realized walked in some of the same discouraging paths and walkways that I also have walked down. Now, let me read you what he told me a few years ago. This was in December the eight, on December the 18th, 1722. December 18th, 1722, I opened this up. The, the first time I read it was on my computer, and later I got the, the printed edition. And I came across the diary of a famous man. I came across the diary of a preacher that I greatly respect. I came across the diary of a preacher who, though it doesn't really matter, passed away on the same day that my mom passed away, March 22nd. I read his biographies. I read some of his sermons. Many of you are probably familiar with this sermon because most people say it's the most famous sermon ever ever preached in American history. Some people would even say that this preacher, even secular people would argue that this man was one of the greatest philosophers and theologians to ever put his foot on American soul. So I had this idea in my mind of this great man of God who never struggled with anything that American Christians struggle with in 2014, 15, 16, and 17. And in God's providence, the people who had his diary and they transferred it to to the printed page, it was cut off in a certain spot. Now, some of the stuff he would wrote, he would say, I started this book such and such. I had this book rebound and re-leathered on such and such a date. He would sign his name in the front of it. But it's as if this diary was cut off at a certain spot. So we don't know what his first entry was. We don't know what his second or third or fourth entry was. We don't even know how much time passed from the beginning of his diary till the very first thing we come across. But if we were to go up to, I believe, in Connecticut or New Jersey, that area tonight, and we were to go to a very old and ancient, not ancient is the right word, a very old and library with a lot of antique writings in it, and if we were to pull out that diary of someone who, I, don't, I think it's safe to say this isn't idolatry. I'd say it's respecting those who have paved the way before you. I've got a little coin of his face in my office, and I've got a poster of his resolutions in my office. And I remember sitting in my office reading the very first diary entry that he wrote that we have. And he said this, The reason why I, who some people would call the greatest preacher and theologian in American history, The reason why I question or doubt my interest in God's love and favor is, number one, because I cannot speak so fully to my experience of that preparatory work of which the divine speak. So here's a young man who literally changed church history. And we go into his private life, and he says, sometimes I wonder if God loves me. Sometimes I wonder if God is gracious to me. And if we were to go to him and say, Jonathan, why do you think that? And he would say, because my testimony doesn't line up with the way preachers say that a testimony is supposed to sound. Number two, he says, sometimes I wonder if God really loves me because I do not remember that I experienced regeneration exactly in those steps in which divines say it is generally wrong. Jonathan would say, the second reason I wonder sometimes if God really loves me, he he would say, the second reason I wonder sometimes if I'm really a recipient of the grace of God, let's translate it to 2017, although he would be in a different setting, he would say this, I can't tell you exactly when I came under, quote, Holy Ghost conviction. Jonathan would say, I can't tell you what pew I was sitting in when the Holy Spirit opened up my eyes. Jonathan would say, altar calls didn't exist in the 1700s. He would say, I didn't respond to an altar call. He would say, I didn't repeat 
a sinner's prayer. And he had all of these divines, all of these high up noble religious leaders who said, guess what? If you're saved, it'll be because you do X, Y, Z. Well, how do I know that, preacher? Because when I got saved, I did X, Y, Z, and it's my way or the highway. And he would also say this. Sometimes I feel like I wonder, sometimes I doubt whether or not God loves me because I feel like I don't have enough faith. How many of us would be honest enough to say, yeah, that sounds like me too? And he said, lastly, the fourth reason sometimes I wonder if God really loves me is because I'm guilty of sins of omission and commission. I'm guilty of doing things that I shouldn't do and not doing the things that I should do. Jonathan Edwards lacked assurance of salvation. So why is it a surprise to me that Tony Walker sometimes lacks assurance of salvation? Why is it a surprise that sometimes 51, 52-year-old men who have been in church their entire life can hear a gospel message clearly explaining the gospel without adding man-made traditions to it and with tears in their eyes say, Tony, thank you for telling me that. I've never heard anybody say that. Why in Salem, South Carolina, did an 80-year-old woman come to me and say, Tony, thank you for giving the gospel without adding man-made tradition to it? We're guilty sometimes of adding something to the things to the word of God that God never said need to be there. Now there's a lot of ways that can look, and I'm not going to get to it this evening, get into it this evening. But just speaking generically, there's a lot of people in this world who are truly saved, and they battle with what we're going to talk about tonight, a lack of assurance of knowing they're born again. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight, but if I were to do that, and if I were to say, you know, the usual, every eye closed, every eye, I can't even get it right, you know, look down and raise your hand. If I were to ask you to do that, probably a lot of you would raise your hand and say, Tony, I'm not going to admit it in an independent Baptist church because I'll get judged as being a lost person. I definitely wouldn't admit it at an independent Baptist camp meeting because they'll throw me out the door and tell me I don't, I'm not under enough convic conviction to be saved, which I have seen before. Someone went to an altar, said they wanted to be saved, and the preacher said, "Now, nah, if you really wanted to be saved, you, you would have more emotion in your life. Send him back to his seat. If, if many of you tonight would admit, Tony, yeah, I wouldn't tell everybody, and I don't post it on Facebook, but sometimes I wonder, am I really saved? If that's you tonight, I want to do something with you line by line that probably somebody has never done with you before. I want to help you from the Word of God when you leave here tonight. If God will grant it by His grace and the working of His Spirit, I want you to leave this building tonight knowing that you're born again. I'm not asking you to make a, your 13th rededication. I'm not asking you to walk down the aisle for the 4th or 5th or the 17th time. I'm not asking you to repeat a prayer. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head. What I'm asking you tonight is to put all of your trust in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, the assurance of salvation is something that men have craved in all generations. To know when they go to bed at night that they are truly right with God. Now, early in the New Testament, a hurting father seeking deliverance for his hurting son cried with tears in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, what Christians, honest Christians, have constantly cried over the entire course of their lifetime, some of them, Lord, I believe... Help thou mine unbelief. How many of you have you ever read that in Mark chapter 9 and thought, man, that's me right there? How many of you have ever come across that man crying with tears in Mark chapter 9 and said, I know I believe. I know beyond a shadow of doubt that I am saved and born again. And two seconds later, you say, well, do I really? Many of you have been there, haven't you? 
I can tell by the reaction. You may not say it. We may not talk about it publicly, especially in a Baptist church, but the majority of you tonight, you've been there. And many of you are nodding your heads, and I can see it. Lord, I believe, but with tears. Lord, help thou my unbelief. That was the cry of a man in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ did not rebuke him. As a matter of fact, you go back and read the story. Jesus rebuked the disciples. You read Mark chapter 9, verse 24, you know what you find? Jesus Christ not binding a whip together so he can run that man out. You find a high priest that is compassionate and that is full of tender mercy who grants that man what he desired even though that man was the first to admit that his faith was not everything that it should be. A lack of full assurance of salvation which will result in a lack of our joy being full is a battle in our present time that many of us would admit to. It is a battle from church history that the greatest preachers and theologians to walk in this country also dealt with. We see the example in the New Testament, in New Testament biblical history, this man in Mark chapter 9. And going to where I asked you to look at when, uh, when I first mentioned the verses in Isaiah chapter 50, we also see that it goes back even to Old Testament biblical history. So just in case you haven't found it, if you'll look in Isaiah chapter 50. I think I told you that. If I didn't, please forgive me. I probably didn't. Isaiah chapter 50. About middle of the Bible. You got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50, we find that even in the Old Testament, there's not two gods in your Bible, a God of Old Testament wrath and a God of New Testament grace. There's one God, and we find out with the, the continuity, continuity of the Testaments uh, that the same God that is gracious in the New Testament was also gracious in the Old Testament. And he could be gracious in the Old Testament because he was looking forward to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. Now, in Isaiah chapter 50, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 10, we read this. Isaiah 50 verse 10, it asks this question. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? So the people referred to in Isaiah, they're not backslidden hypocrites. They're not false professors. professors. They're not those that would despise and turn their back on God. We are speaking about people who fear the Lord, and this is inspired scripture, so we know it's correct. They fear the Lord, and then secondly, they obey the Lord. They obey the voice of his servant. And then notice what it says about those fearing and obeying people that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Does that describe, not the multitude tonight, is there one or two people in here that the Lord sent me to help tonight that would admit, Tony, I fear God. And to the best of my ability, I obey Him. And right now, I'm surrounded by darkness spiritually. Right now, I look around and I see no spiritual light to my soul. Our tender, compassionate, loving God, He tells you this. Let Him, let that fearing and obeying but walking in darkness and having no light, let that person trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. You know what God tells you tonight? Not if you're lost, but if you're saved, and it seems as if you're in a spiritual valley. It seems as if you have no assurance. It seems as if every day you don't know if you're right with God or if you're not. But you know in the depths of your soul that you're fearing and you're obeying, you're trusting and you're loving and you're serving and you're reading and you're praying and you still lay your bed at night and say, lay your bed at, lay your head on the bed at night and say, "I'm just not sure if I'm right with God." God tells you this. You say you trust, keep trusting. You say you're staying with me, keep staying on me as your God. Somebody would say, well, that's the Old Testament. Some people would say, well, surely in the New Testament, 
If Christ saves someone, they'll know a hundred percent beyond a shadow of a doubt, and some people do. I realize that. Some people would say, if you're saved, you're going to know it. Some preachers would say, if you're a new, if you're a new creature, you're going to know it. Some people say, surely if you doubt your salvation, well, that just means you never really had it to start with. Some people would say, if you've been genuinely born again, don't tell me you won't know the exact second that it happened. And then the usual, don't tell me somebody as big as God moved in your heart and you don't know absolutely positively that it happened. Now, here's the problem. That sounds good, doesn't it? It's not in the Bible. How many times did Jesus say in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, when that man said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, did Jesus look at him and say, well... If you've got any unbelief in your heart, that's proof that your belief is hypocritical in the first place. Get out of my face, hypocrite. Is that what Jesus did to someone who believed but still had in his heart unbelief? No. You hear a lot of things at churches and camp meetings, don't you, and revivals? Problem is, many of them aren't in the Bible. They're just cliches that have been repeated as time passes on. Were we left with only the ideas and opinions of men and evangelists whose income is getting people to walk down an aisle where there are only ideas and opinions, you know what, we might feel despair. But we have something more settled, more authoritative, more trustworthy, more sure, and we have the Word of God. When we do walk in what seems like darkness... No matter how closely we look, it seems as if there is no light shining. I want you to know this. That the Bible says in 2 Peter that there's a light that shines in darkness. There is a word that is more sure than even voices coming from heaven. And that is the word of God. And as we'll see, the New Testament instruction of 1 John chapter 5 mirrors what we just read in Isaiah chapter 50. So if you'll now turn from Isaiah chapter 50 to 1 John chapter 5. In case that last comment didn't make much sense about the evangelists, and and I'm not saying all of them are bad. I'm sure many of them are sincerely serving the Lord and not getting rich in the process. But you know, if if a man is trying to keep up a good lifestyle by booking, getting meetings booked, and the more pictures he puts on Facebook of people going down an aisle, don't tell me he's not going to send somebody, don't tell me that he's not going to use a little bit of emotional manipulation to get people walking down that aisle. Say, Tony, how can you say that? The teenager saw that last summer, and I saw a group of young people go down to an altar, and without speaking to them individually, which would have been impossible, without getting other people to speak to them individually and seeing what their true spiritual need was. You know what he did? He just assumed that all those young people needed to be saved. So you had a couple hundred young people standing there, and he said, look at this great work of God. I'm I'm just going to quit preaching in the middle of my sermon. Y'all need the Lord. Y'all need to be saved. Pray this prayer with me. You, You know what we need? You know what teenagers need? You know what little 80-year-old ladies who've been in the church in the mountains for all their life need? They don't need to go down to the altar for the 15th time. They need to hear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners, and if you repent and believe, you'll be saved. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. So, opinions of men versus the Word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John gives hope to those who are truly born again, but lack assurance. This verse shows us that believing in Christ and not knowing that you have eternal life, as strange as it may be, is possible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says this. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So they're believers. They're collectively hearing the word of God read in a a fellowship of believers. 
They believe, not just a generic belief, their belief is genuine. It's really in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And John tells these genuine believers, I want you to know something. Right now, not in the future, not if you endure, not at the very end, if you hold out, although you will endure and although you will hold out. Right now, presently, you possess eternal life. Right now. I'm speaking to believers tonight. If you're lost, this message is not for you primarily. If you are a believer, I want you to know that right now, you have eternal life dwelling inside of you. How is that possible? Because you have eternal life itself, Jesus Christ dwelling inside of you. He tells them, believers, I want you to know, he did not assume that they would know. He did not demand that if they really were saved, they really would know. He said, if you have believed in Christ, I want you to know that you have right now at this present moment, children of God, you have eternal life. So in the next couple of minutes, I just want to share a few quick points. Now, that was a long introduction. This will be a a very brief thing. Somebody told me, said, I'm going to start texting you at 7 o'clock that it's it's time to go. And I said, don't worry, there's a ball game I want to see at 8 o'clock, so I'm not going to keep you too long. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. First of all, we see his method of communicating. He says, I have written. I have written. How does God communicate with his people? He writes us a letter called the Word of God. Now the Bible says in the the past God spoke in many diverse and sundry ways. God spoke audibly in the Bible. You read times like that. When Jesus Christ was baptized, that's the clearest example. The voice come from heaven that says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God spoke audibly. God spoke through his prophets, men who would show up in the course of Jewish history who would say, thus saith the Lord, and that was God speaking through them. Thirdly, we have the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the capital word of God. But lastly, we have the written word of God. Now a question for you. If you could go back in time and you could pick any one of those four ways that God communicates with people, which one would you pick? You would probably say, man, I would love to hear God speak from heaven. I would love to walk outside and hear voices in my ears. But here's a question. How do you know that's the voice of God? How many women are in jail tonight because they thought, they really thought God told them to kill their children? How many people have ruined their homes and their marriages because they just knew God told them it was okay to go with that woman or that man? How many people have forsook and left the church because they said, God told me in my heart, God laid it on my heart, and God told me that it was time for me to move? How many people have attributed God to Satan's voice? We don't want to live in the time of hearing God's audible voice from heaven. Secondly, I would argue, we don't even want to live in the time when God speaks through prophets. Because... That means you would have to try every single thing that they say. What if they say one thing and ten bad things? Well, what are you going to do with the one good thing? We don't want to live in the days of prophets. You'd say, well, certainly I wish I could live in the time of the capital W word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what it would be like to hear the voice of Jesus. That's assuming you would have gotten close enough to hear his voice. Because Jesus Christ didn't walk around with a microphone recording podcast and put it on the internet. He dwelt in one little spot on this earth and for the most part never traveled outside of that spot. You say, I would have loved to be him back in that time. You might have spent your entire life just trying to get through the multitude just to hear him say one sentence. So I'm going to argue that we have something... I'm not going to say it's, it's better, period. But I'm going to say for us today in 2017, we have something better than hearing voices from heaven. We have something better than men claiming to speak on behalf of God. We even have something better for us today than Jesus Christ walking on this earth and being confined to one, being in one place at one time. You say, Tony, what could be possibly better suited for us today You've got it right in front of you. You've got it right in front of you. 
And the first thing we need to know about the assurances of, of our salvation, it rests in the written word of God. He says, these things have I written unto you. His method of communication. Secondly, who is his audience? Does he say, I've written these things so that everyone could know they're going to heaven? No. He puts a limiting factor on this, who this applies to. And he says, you that believe, right now you're still believing on the name of the Son of God. One of the scariest verses in the Bible, 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. I hear many of you turning. That's good. Back up maybe a page or two to 1 John chapter 2. Excuse me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us. And who's the us? Those who believe on the name of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, if they had been true believers, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Say, Tony, translate that. Everybody talking to heaven, talking about heaven's not going there. Every teenager that showed spurts of life in a youth group and today could care less about Jesus Christ. That's scary. Somewhere along the line, somebody came to them and told them that if they prayed one prayer, they'd be okay the rest of their life. And that's why you have 30, 40, 50-year-olds. You saved? Yeah. When would you get saved? In youth group? You've been serving Jesus? Not the last 40 years. Guess what? You didn't get saved. Not Tony, not Tony, God. God said, how you start is, imp yes, it's important, but if you started with us, if you started as a believer, and you didn't continue, you went out from us, not because you moved away to college, not because you got a job and moved elsewhere, because you renounced Jesus Christ, guess what? You never were of us in the first place. And how sad that many people who believe in eternal security, once saved, always saved, just as much as I do, they're going to cling to once saved, always saved, instead of clinging to Jesus Christ and here when they get, when they think they're going to heaven, depart from me, for I never knew you. So John is writing to a specific group of people, those who believe on the name of the Son of God, and he tells them why he is writing to them, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants his children to have assurance. Now, what, is, what are some reasons why some Christians lack assurance? What are some reasons that genuine believers wonder, many teenagers, I, I wouldn't preach this tonight if it wasn't something I thought about and had to deal with before. Am I, am I really saved? Number one, how, how does God communicate and give assurance to his people? Through the, by the Spirit, through the Word of God. So guess what? Guess what, baby? You don't drink milk, you don't grow. Guess what, vehicle? You don't put gas, you don't get gas, you don't drive. Christian, you don't hear the Word of God, you'll usually lack assurance. If you wonder right now if you're truly right with God, my first question, not this isn't a one and done deal, but my first question would be, are you reading privately and hearing publicly the word of God? God gives assurance not through miraculous means, but through the word. Number one, are you hearing that word being preached and read? Secondly, some Christians lack assurance because they depend on their emotions and on their feelings. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell me something. We're sinners. Guess what fell in the Garden of Eden? Humanity. You know what makes up humanity? Feelings and emotions. So guess what, believer? Your feelings and your emotions, they're fallen. 
they're sinful. The, the same reason that a Christian can commit all these wicked sins and, and truly repent afterwards is the same reason why you let your feelings and your emotions get in the way of your assurance in Jesus Christ. I, I think of it like this. I, I think I read it maybe in, in one of these books. He said that trusting your feelings and your emotions and depending on your feelings and your emotions would be like going outside. I, I don't know. I've, I've been in here for a few hours. I'm not sure what it looks like outside. But if we were to go outside right now, and I think it was raining earlier, so there's probably some clouds. And if I were to look up at the sky and say, blue sky, clouds, I don't see the sun, so it must be night. That's foolish. Letting the clouds get in front of the sun and denying that the sun is behind those clouds, that's ridiculous. True believer, not hypocrite, true believer, if you're letting your emotions and your feelings come between you and the Son of God, that's just as foolish as walking outside at 12 noon on a cloudy day and say, well, I guess the sun did not come up today. Thirdly, third reason some Christians lack assurance, I am a Baptist. Let's throw that out there. I believe Christ died for the sins of the world. I, I believe everything everyone else believes. But thirdly, you know why some people lack assurance? Because they can't tell you the exact day, minute, hour, second that they were born again. Yeah. Some people don't have assurance because they hear some guy who, who, who uh, raped a few women, did drugs, went to jail for 15 years, and now he gets out of jail and he goes around giving this glorious testimony how he was not just born again, gloriously born again. Guess what? Every, every born-again experience is glorious. But he got gloriously saved. If you're saved, it was glorious. It glorified God. But he gets up and he says, I just want y'all to know. I knelt, and I'm not making fun, but I am trying to get you to think. I'm trying to help not everybody, but the one or two people in here that I know this is meant to help. That evangelist or that guy out of prison, I'll never forget it. January 1st, 1970. That date shows up on a lot of computer things, so we'll use that. January 1st, 1970, 9.41 a.m. in the morning. I don't even know. Facing east, kneeling on that piece of board in the church or in the jail, whatever. I know that I got saved at 7.05 p.m. in 13 seconds. I've heard something very similar to that, and I'm sure many of you have too, haven't you? Question number two, how many of you can get that detailed in your conversion experience? Not very many people. And so here's somebody with good intentions. I'm going to get up and I'm going to give my testimony and I'm going to tell them the very exact second I got saved. And you know what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? Emma Faith and Christian and Christopher and many of your children, Caleb, that grow up in church that will never remember a time that they did not believe in Jesus Christ. One day Emma Faith is going to come to me and say, Daddy, I went to that youth group retreat, and they said if you don't know the exact date you got saved, if you don't know the exact date you got saved, you must not have really got saved. And I'm going to say, Honey, you going to listen to man or you going to listen to God? Amen. Now I realize that rubs a, that goes against the grain. But if going with God's word goes against the grain, I'm going to go with God's word. I am not going to bind the conscience of true believers because I want them to... I want to get the pat on the back. Teenager, young person, when you give that testimony, make sure you say, Tony led you to the Lord. I don't need that. I don't need the pat on the back. I don't need the false security. I don't need that vain comfort. I don't need that vain glory. If your salvation is, I got saved in 2001, and you're not exactly sure when, I would say, okay, I'm not going to take that, but let's say, okay, 2017, do you believe in Christ as your Savior? Yes. 2017, do you trust Christ and Christ alone for salvation? Yes. Do you believe there's any other way to heaven for you or anyone else? No. Then although you may not be able to pinpoint the exact minute that it happened in 2001, yeah, you probably did really get saved. Say, Tony, how do you know that's true? Because that's my testimony. 
spring 2001. And as much as the independent Baptists where I went to Bible college were not completely satisfied with that, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. If that question ever comes up in a committee or a council or anything one day in the future, I'm not going to make up a lie just to make them feel better. If they're going to demand that I know the exact second I was saved, I'm going to tell them, okay, you tell me what exact second you were born physically. And guess what? They're probably not going to be able to say it. But do I look at somebody physically and say, you're living, you're breathing, you're walking, you're growing, but if you don't know the exact second, you must not be a real person anyway. That's dumb. And it's just as foolish to look at a true, not a hypocrite now, but to look at a true Christian and say, they're growing they're learning, they're, they're feeding, they're praying, they're filled with the Spirit. And if their conversion can only be narrowed down to a season and a year, I'd take that before I would take the 25-year-old who can tell you the day he got saved in youth group and he hasn't lived for Jesus since. Saved, in quotes. I would much rather see a vague beginning in a very detailed Christian life than a detailed testimony with no Christian life to follow. And fourthly, I real, I'm sorry, those who said something earlier. I know we're nine minutes past seven. Number four, how do some, why do some Christians lack assurance? Because they can't compare their testimony to others. Is that Caleb sitting there? Where you at, Caleb Burdett? Caleb, Isaac, how about, how about if you are seven years old and younger? Stand up. Okay, how old are you, Caleb? Okay, let's say 10. If you're 10 and younger, stand up. How many we got? Let's see, one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. If you, if you are 10 and younger, guess what? When you're at least my age, at least the age when I got saved, you're going to hear these people give these testimonies. Football players that beat women. Girls who threw their life away. Men who fried their brain on drugs. Women who threw away their, their, their virtue, for lack of a better word. Your testimony is not going to compare to that one bit. They're going to get invited to the youth rallies to tell their testimony, and you're not going to invited to say anything. You know why? Because I trust that every one of you that stood up, you can be seated, I trust that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And guess what? You've got, quote, a boring testimony. Praise God for boring testimonies. Praise God for children who can't tell you how many times they threw their virtue away. Praise God for 15-year-olds who can't tell you they threw their life away on drugs and alcohol. Praise the Lord for bo testimonies that do not get invited to the youth groups in Tennessee, the youth rallies in Tennessee. There's nothing boring, as someone said famously, there's nothing boring about being raised from the dead to life. There's nothing boring about Jesus Christ saving your soul from hell. So don't make this mistake, young people and older people alike. The reason nobody asks us to share our testimonies, there's a reason. Because it doesn't bring in the big offerings to keep those things, those big Christian conventions flowing. Don't compare your testimony to other people. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the, the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, where it wants to. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone, every single person that is born of the Spirit. Just as you can't go outside and say that the wind blows against every leaf uniformly, it's unique in how it deals with every single plant, every single part of nature, so the Holy Spirit is going to deal with every single one of us in a unique way. So don't make the mistake of comparing your testimony to others. Where am I at? Basically, biblically, there's two groups tonight. See what happens when you take your glasses off. Biblically, there's two groups tonight. Believing and not believing. Saved and perishing. Your name's in the book of life or it's not. Saved and lost. But in those two categories, we're going to call it, there's two subcategories. Making up a total of four groups. 
Up here, I'm going to say saved and assured. You're saved and you know it. You're saved and you have never doubted it. I know of at least one person who has said publicly that is their testimony and I have no problem. I envy that. Oh, how I envy that, especially when I was in my younger 20s listening to a certain stream of preaching and preachers. If you're saved and you know it 110%, my prayer tonight for you is that the Word of God, even though it's on a high level, I trust, your faith has been increased just a little bit more. You're saved and assured. There's also some who are lost and they know it. There's some who are going to heaven and they know it. There's also some who are going to hell and they would admit it if, if they would be honest. My prayer for you tonight is that God's word by the Holy Spirit, tonight your eyes have been opened, your ears will start hearing, you'll be given a new heart instead of a stony heart, namely you'll believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Third category, saved and not so sure. My prayer for you tonight is that the same action that saved you, trust in Jesus Christ, would continue through the rest of your life, and that's where your assurance would come from. Trusting Jesus Christ. Not as a one-time event, but for all of your life, like the Bible says, the just will live by faith. I trust that if you're saved and lack assurance tonight, the written word of God that gives you assurance... I hope that you'll leave here this evening knowing that Christ redeems people eternally, He saves people completely, and He forgives people fully. There's saved people who know it. There's lost people who know it. There's saved people who lack assurance, and here's the scary one. There's lost people who have a false assurance. You would say, Tony, you would say, it's dangerous to be saved and not know it. It'll hurt your Christian life. Yeah. John would say earlier, it takes away from having a full, complete joy. But while a saved and lacking assurance, while that may discourage you, it's not going to damn you. That's right. But here's the fourth category. If you're lost and you don't even realize it, if you're lost and you think you're saved, you're lost and you think everything is A-OK, -okay, that will damn you to hell. You say, Tony, OK, I see what you're doing. You're, you're making this graphic and you're inverting it in your mind. Saved and not having assurance. So what's the flip side? Not saved but having a false assurance. Are you doing what you said earlier? Are you guilty of emotional manipulation and the reason of men? No. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said this. Probably the next verse, if, if 1 John 2.19 is the second scariest verse in the Bible, here's this one. And I'm going to show you the scariest word in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, and it's his will that all be saved. Verse 22, scariest word in the Bible, M-A-N-Y, many. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, Lord, have we not in thy name cast out devils? Lord, Lord, have we not in thy name done many wonderful works? And then Jesus says, will I profess unto them many? I never, 1 John 2, 19, I never knew you. But I'm going to extend to you a second chance. No. I never knew you. But my grace overrides my justice. No. I never knew you. Depart from me. You are preaching in my name. You are prophesying in my name. You are casting out devils in my name. You are doing many wonderful works in my name. I tell you what you are doing. You are working iniquity because you were not truly born again. You are not adding good works. You are heaping up condemnation on top of your damnation. Saved and going to heaven and you know it, praise the Lord that you're not struggling what most people struggle with, a lack of assurance. Going to hell and you know it, tonight I trust you've heard the gospel and you can be saved and born again. Saved but lacking assurance, here's what you need. You need the word of God, rightly preached in public and read in private. But lost with a false assurance, I pray tonight that God would open up your eyes. 
And the same power that was behind the creation of God when he said, let there be light, Genesis 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that he would tell your soul tonight, let there be spiritual light. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Lord, though it could use much better eloquence and education, Lord, I trust that I've done it to the best of my ability and beyond that, that your Holy Spirit has worked through me. Lord, I know that in a, in a, in a church with, with mature Christians, there may not be a whole lot that are dealing with this at the moment, but I'm sure they're based on experience preaching these type messages. There's some who are. Lord, there's children tonight, spiritual children, who wonder if you're their father. What, what a sad way to live that I've been guilty of before. Lord, would you please give them peace and assurance and comfort that passes all understanding. Lord, for those who are not saved, would you please open up their eyes, whether they think they're going to heaven or they know they're going to hell. Would you please, Lord, do the work of conversion tonight. I pray, Lord, that sinners would be converted to you and your children would keep trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.